So we are in a series called Friend. It is in the book of James. Uh, And last week, we went through the crux of the passage. What was the main sermon that James was trying to get across? And it was his idea of whether what we act shows our friendship with the world or it shows our friendship with God. And he had a call to conversion at the end saying, listen, it is time to repent. Humble yourselves before God. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. And so... There's one thing that James says that he begins to continue, and what today's sermon is called is this. He he says that God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. And so today what we are going to talk about are the different ways that the church has become arrogant that James is writing to. There we go. Come on. Somebody is already excited. Breaking that spirit of pride today. Come on. All right. That was a little overboard for some people. It's okay. (laughs) We're in James chapter 4. We're going to read from verse 11 to chapter 5, verse 6. You can read along with me on the screens, um, and we'll start off here. James says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for yet a little time and then vanishes Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who have mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. A lot here that we're going to go over today. Um, And James has an order of the different types of arrogance that he goes over. It goes from a private arrogance to a public arrogance to a systematic arrogance. And we're going to talk about the different ways each of those things play out uh, in the church and how we can respond to those things. And so, as I said last week, we learned that God opposes the proud. What does that mean? That that means if we find pride in our heart, if we walk in ways that are arrogance, we actually find ourselves in opposition to God. We are in the ring with God, and that is not a ring that you want to be in. A friend of the world is arrogant. A friend of God, we have learned, is arrogant. Humble. So James, this week, he gives us these three examples of these different kinds of arrogance that are going on in the church. You know, we have learned week after week after week that the church is susceptible to acting just like the world. The church is susceptible to acting just like the world. And so when a lot of people accuse the church of being hypocrites, many times their accusations are true. And that is essentially what James is saying is that I have found that you have called yourselves Christians, you have come to the assembly, you have said you have faith in God, but yet you live like the world. And so James is correcting that. 
And so the first form of arrogance we find is in verses 11 and 12, where James says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So the first form of arrogance that we're going to talk about today is a private arrogance. It finds itself in slander, in speaking evil against another person. This is many times called gossiping. I know none of you ever heard of that word before, so I'm just trying to introduce to you something. What, is, what does gossip do? What does slander do? What, what happens when you gossip against somebody and you're in secret, you're behind closed doors, what you do is you elevate yourself above that person. And what you do to that person is you lower that person's worth in the eyes of others and in your own eyes. This is the kind of pride that God rejects. The kind of person that would put other people down in order to elevate themselves in speech. And if you wonder, man, what, what, are, uh, what are things that are gossipy, Justin, or uh, I'm, I'm sure I don't slander. Well, let's go, let's go through a list of things that Paul is, uh, sorry, James is getting at here. Is what you are talking about, when you're talking about somebody and you're talking about them in private, is what you are saying about them hurting them? Is it hurting them? Is what you're talking about behind closed doors? Are you trying to keep it hush-hush so that they don't know what you are talking about against them? Does what you say elevate you above the other person? Are you using words like stupid and dumb and idiot and moron? Why? Because what you're doing is you're assuming that you are not stupid, dumb, idiot, or moron that the other person is all these things, and so you are lifting yourself above them. Are you in conflict with the person and now venting to somebody about this conflict, not to the person, but to a friend? If you answer yes to these things, then the encouragement that I give to you is do not be opposed by God. Stop what you are doing. James says what you are doing is not only speaking bad against the person, but you are speaking bad against the law. You are speaking bad against the law. And when you speak bad against the law, you are now becoming a judge of the law instead of what he has been telling you to be the entire time, be a doer of the law, right? We have heard, don't be a hearer, be a doer. Now he's saying, don't be a judge of the law, be a doer of the law. And this is what he means by this. That the first and foremost, when we look at the law and we understand the royal law that we've been going through, we've seen in Leviticus 19 about how to treat our neighbor, how to love our neighbor, the echoes of the Sermon on the Mount that we have lived where Jesus reiterates the law and explains it. That he says that we should aim to just do it. Do it. Don't talk about what you think is good or bad or whatever. When you think about the law, be a doer of the law. Of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Is loving those above yourself. Of being a servant. Leviticus 19.16 says this. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. So James says, just be a doer of the law, all of it. The law says don't slander, so don't do it. You know, I love James for his simplicity. But when you slander somebody, what you are doing is now you are putting yourself above the law and you are saying that these are the laws are good laws, and I'm going to follow these laws. And these laws are bad laws, and I'm not going to follow these. So we are putting ourselves in a place of judgment of the royal law, of the you shall love your neighbor as yourself law. And when you do that, you are now placing yourself as judge, saying this is good to follow, 
this is bad to follow. And James says, guess what? There is only one judge, the lawgiver. And you know who that lawgiver is? Not you. (laughs) I love James. He's a gangster. But you know what this is not saying before we get there? Is, you know, Christians, or I, I don't know, I would say friend of the world Christians, I'm going there right now. Their favorite saying is, don't judge me. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And this, is, and this is where context is important. We talked about context when we talked about faith and works, and now we're going to talk about context around judging or slandering your neighbor. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 says this, What have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not that those inside the church whom you are to judge... God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. So a lot of people will read James and they'll, and they'll make their, their new mantra, see, don't judge me. And basically what they mean is, let me live my life in sin and peace. This is a relationship between me and God, and so you can walk away. And what it does is it is the American version of Christianity where it is an individual faith and it is not a communal faith where we can correct, mutually correct one another and say, actually, what you're doing is sin. This is against the truth. You shouldn't be doing this because this goes against the way that God has called us to live. And we have used this verse in an improper context and said, well, let me live in sin and peace because God knows my heart. Well, brother, sister, that's the reason why I want to correct you, because God knows your heart. And it is deceitful and wicked above all else. And so if you are following your heart, you are following your heart straight into destruction. And so what is the difference There's two key differences between what James is talking about and what Paul is talking about. The judgment James is against is a secret judgment that is dishonoring and meant to hurt someone and not uplift them. The judgment that Paul is talking about is about correcting sin. It is supposed to not dishonor somebody but it is supposed to lead them to repentance. And it is God-honoring, not God-dishonoring. So slander and gossip dishonors God, dishonors the royal law, but correcting a brother or sister who is in sin is God-honoring and loving your neighbor. Just as if you are in sin and headed to destruction, or I was, I would want someone to correct me. What James is saying is arrogant of us to do is to slander someone, elevating ourselves above them. And therefore, when we do that, we're picking which laws we want to follow and which laws we don't, which places us in the most arrogant place. It places us in the seat of God, saying, I know the correct ways to live and the incorrect ways to live. The second arrogance that James talks about is a public arrogance. It reveals itself in how we live out our lives. We're going to read from verses 13 to 17. James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. For whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James starts off this section, this second type of arrogance, with, Come now, you who say. Come now, you who say. As James so often points out, as scripture so often points out, our speech 
reveals the orientation of our heart. The things that we say reveals the way that we feel. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So James uses this example of an entrepreneur who makes their plans. He or she looks at the year, thinks about what they're going to do. He is using a market trader. I'm going to go to this place and sell these goods and purchase these goods, and I'm going to go here and sell these goods and purchase these goods, and at the end of the year, I will make a nice, tidy profit, and I will be good. But the example is not exclusive to entrepreneurs. He's just using an entrepreneur as an example. What James is coming across and saying here is that everyone who thinks that they can plan, that they can consider their life, or they can think ahead without consideration for God, is in for a rude awakening. This is the truth. The truth is this, that we do not know what tomorrow will hold. You know, I have been to enough funerals in my life to realize that, as scripture says, tomorrow is not promised to us. And a lot of times we like to arrogantly live our lives as this tomorrow is promised to us. And we begin to make plans whether to go here, to go there, to make a profit here, to do that, about work, about career, about family. And what we don't do, what is missing from all that consideration, what is missing from all of those plans is a simple thing called prayer. And what we do is we use our human wisdom, we use our human ingenuity, we use our human understanding and we begin to strategize. We begin to think about, man, how can I do this? How do I become successful? How do I, you know, ride the corporate ladder? How do I start a business? How do I make profit this year? How do I, unfortunately, a lot of times, grow a church? I've been in enough church planning sessions where prayer was never mentioned once to realize that James is not just talking about business. But James, he says, it is arrogant to think that we can plan for the future without consideration of the will of God. When we think about our future, when we think about our lives, when we think about our goals, where we think about where we want to go in the next year, right? 2019 is coming up, and many of us will be making New Year's resolutions. We'll be thinking about all the ways that we've hated 2018 and all the ways that we're, 2019 is going to be different and the world is going to be better and these, all these things that are going to happen in 2019. And many times at the end of 2019, we're going to be thinking about all the ways that 2019 was awful and all the ways that 2020 is going to be amazing and all of this incredible things are going to happen to us. And we wonder time after time why we continue to make plans that do not fulfill us. You know, I, I was talking to one of my friends yesterday about the difference of when I turned 20 and when I turned 30. It was a very, I remember both days pretty vividly. I remember the day I turned 20, uh, I cried most of the day. It was a very sad day, I know. Thank you for laughing at me for crying. I appreciate it. <laughs> but I can laugh at it now. It's not a sore subject. What had happened, what had happened was... In my teen years, I had all these grand plans about everything I was going to accomplish. I had all these amazing things I was going to do. I remember when I was 15, I read a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I you know, got on Photoshop and I wrote down 10 things that were going to happen in my life. And I made it my screensaver of my computer. You remember when like people cared about what their screensaver was? <laughs> and every day when I looked at my computer and I was a computer addict, you know, I had built my first computer in fifth grade, so I was in front of my computer nine hours a day throughout all of high school. I would see these ten things that I was going to do. And I remember there were many things on that list that I was supposed to accomplish while I was a teenager. And they weren't bad things. A lot of the things had to do with ministry, ways that I wanted to see God use me in my own life. And I remember when I turned 20, I cried that day, and I was sad 
because my teenage years were over and all the dreams I had during my teen years were going to die along with my teenage years. I could no longer accomplish everything that I set out to accomplish while I was a teen. And I remember that vividly because I didn't understand why, how I put it, God would give me all these dreams and all this ambition, and then none of it would happen. But I remember the day I turned 30. It was a day of really non-significance in my life, but it was a day of celebration. I didn't do much that day. I had a couple of people over. We cut a cake, and I hung out with my family. It was, I'm an introvert, so that's a great birthday day for me. But I remember thinking that looking back on the last decade of my life, wow, God did way more than I ever thought would happen. And I remember just sitting in a place of bringing celebration and praise to God that, God, I did not expect everything to happen over the last 10 years to happen. You did way more than anything that I thought. Because somewhere along the line in my 20s, God changed the orientation of my heart. Where instead of beginning to make my own plans and strategizing, you see, I'm a futurist. I live in the future. I, I can't get away about thinking about the future. If you ask me at any given time what my six-month, 10-year, 30-year, 5,000-year plan is, I have it ready for you. But I have learned what God has taught me is the arrogance of my ways to think that Really, what I was doing is I was saying, God, here's my plan. This better be your plan, too. And what God has taught me is to live a life open-handed before him. God, wherever you send me, I will go. Whatever you have for me, I will do. Whatever it is that you call me to, I will go. And I found that living a life of saying, God, is this your will? At the end, I may experience downturns, I may experience highs, but those things don't phase me because in the good times and in the bad times, I am content with what God has given me. And so a form of arrogance, James is saying, is when you look at your life, you look at your plans, and you do not consider the will of God, but you look at your will, and then you impose that on God, and you say, these plans better happen. And this can happen with ministry. This can happen with church. Every time people ask me, you know, outside, they say, well, what's the church like? What were your expectations? And I'm just always like, I'm blown away. I didn't really expect anything. I just, God told me to do this, and I prayed a lot, and he sent a lot of great people. Because ultimately, what we have to come to a place is that it is God's will in my life, and if, if he wills me to live tomorrow, then that is his jurisdiction, not mine. If he wills me to live another year, another five years, another ten years, that is his jurisdiction, not mine. And I will plan with God, I will pray, and God will show me, all right, I want you to go this way, and I want you to go that way. And I will just say, God, my life is open-handed before you. Now, there are some times God has given me in saying, this is what's going to happen in the future. And that's okay, because ultimately, if God takes it away, that was his idea in the first place. If God brings it, that was his idea in the first place, not mine. Our plans, our strategies, our contemplations should be saturated in prayer. And anything else is arrogance. It is to stand and to say that I know what is best for my life. My creator who created me does not know what is best for me. He has appointed my day of birth. He has appointed my day of death. And in between, he has appointed each day for me to live. Let me tell you, that lifts so much burden, so much anxiety, so much depression, so much loneliness, all of these things that we keep as deep weights on our lives because we are pressured by society to perform. 
that we have this idea of success in the world that is solely based around money, that is solely based around what your bank account looks like, what your job title is, what your strategic plan is, what your goals are, and if you do not live up to the world's standards of these things, then we are taught that we need to worry. But when every day is a gift from God and is a grace from God, then the worries of those days do not faze me as much as they used to. So do not be arrogant and think you can plan your life without considering God and his will. It will lead, as it did to me, false dreams, a robbed hope, and a lot of disappointment in life. The third form of arrogance is systematic. James reserves his strongest language for this. He says in chapter 5, verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. What James here goes is he goes into a prophetic word. He gives a prophetic word to the wealthy who use their wealth to oppress the laborer or the poor. You know, if you read the Old Testament, you realize that James is doing nothing new, that the Old Testament prophets routinely spoke out against systematic oppression of the poor, especially those in Israel who were supposed to be the people of God who but used their wealth as a way to keep others underneath their feet. What we have to understand is there is a strong Christian business ethic of making sure laborers are paid fairly and on time for their work. We see this all throughout scripture in the Old Testament. We see this in the New Testament in Luke chapter 10 verse 7, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 18, in Romans chapter 4 verse 4, and most importantly what we are reading today, Leviticus 19, as we keep going back to what James calls the royal law, Leviticus 19 13, which says this, you shall not oppress your neighbor. Or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. James says the rich who do this, the ones who use their wealth as oppression to the poor, that they need to weep and to howl. Why? For the miseries that are coming upon them. Miseries in the Old Testament was more specifically reserved for people who resisted God. If there were people who arrogantly resisted God, the Old Testament prophets would most likely prophesy something that was in your future, and that was misery, that it was coming upon you. Why? Because as we read, James said, God opposes the proud, and that is to live a life of misery. And what would happen is, you know, we hear this term day laborers today, but many, that was the main form of labor in the fields. And when a boss was oppressing the laborer, what they would do is they were supposed to be paid at the end of the day for their work. They would keep the wages back and make them wait to receive their wages. And so this is a specific example of how the wealthy were controlling the power, the wealth, and exalting themselves among others and using it to systematically oppress the poor. In James 2, we saw the oppressive rich have a few things about them. They have splendid clothing, they have gold rings, and they were using the court to oppress the poor. Well, what's interesting is here what we're reading in James chapter 5 is a reversal of fortunes for those who are friends of the world and use their wealth in sinful and evil ways. 
the splendid clothing that you liked? What does James says here? Your clothes will be eaten by moths. The gold rings that you wore? James says here, rust will destroy your gold and silver. You dragged the poor into the court as a way to oppress them. Well, guess what? Now in court, your material wealth will be a witness against you with God as your judge. This is powerful, powerful statements that James is making. The very thing that the sinful wealthy were using for their security to win court cases, the thing that secured their future, the thing that brought them life, will now be the thing used to bring it all to nothing. The wealth, it says, will cry out. Just like we saw in the Old Testament, Israel cries out in their oppression in Egypt. Just like it says, Abel's blood cried out from the grave and spoke to God against Cain. Just like that, the wealth of the wicked will cry out against their masters. And the rust of their gold will eat their flesh like fire. The riches literally that is collected in oppression towards people, will then be used as a witness in court against them. Do we see the, the power in that? The very thing that we have idolized many times as a culture, the very thing that is used to oppress people, will be the thing that stands as a witness against the person in the courtroom of heaven. No one who uses their wealth as a means of injustice for selfish ambition will escape the wrath of God. With this, I get to praise Jesus, and I say, thank you, Jesus, that God will have vengeance on our behalf. He says, James says, he is the Lord of armies. Translated here, the Lord of hosts. Who can withstand the Lord of armies? Do you know how governments make sure that people abide by the court? The army that they have behind it. God has an army behind him that no one will be able to withstand in the day of court. And we can praise God that even though there may be injustice against people here on earth, maybe injustice against us, that God will have vengeance. And the very things used to oppress us will be the very things used as a witness against the oppressor in court. Luxury, self-indulgence, these are the things that we put a premium on in our culture. But it says that these very things lead to fattened hearts in the day of slaughter. You know, this is such incredible imagery, what James is saying here. He's, he's saying that you have stuffed your hearts with pleasure. You have stuffed it with oppression. You have stuffed it with indulgence. And those very things that you have stuffed your heart with, they will and are preparing you for the day of slaughter. Do you know what you do to animals to prepare them for the day of slaughter? You stuff them up real good, fat, and juicy. Because when the slaughter comes, you have a nice meal before you where James is saying the indulgence, the selfish ambition, the oppression, what it has done is it has fattened you up for the day of slaughter. When judgment comes upon you, the things that you have looked to, the things that you have loved, the things that you have allowed to fatten the heart of your soul would be the very things that stand against you. You know, as I look back on my dreams as a teenager, I remember one of the things I wrote down on that list of 10 things was that I would be a millionaire by the time I was 26. And I remember when I wrote that down, I know some you, you can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> when I wrote that down, I was, in my heart, 
idolizing the very things that James is speaking against, self-indulgence, pleasure that goes beyond, that is not moderated, that fattens up. And in our society, we look at the Bezos or we look at the Steve Jobs and we look at them and we say, and we look at the great clothing chains and we look at all these big corporations and we look, that is what I want to become. And we learn from them and they write books and we devour them and we listen to podcasts from them and we think, how can I become like them? And we idolize these things and we think that we're missing out on life if we don't attain this status of wealth that is 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 billion dollars. Those are the ones who made it. Those are the ones who are successful. Yet those are the ones who have fattened their hearts for the days of slaughter. Why? Because read about the ways that they use their wealth to oppress people all over the globe. And the factory laborers and the industry after industry where you see these protests where in the U.S. we're used to at this point certain standards of employment where they don't have that in many third world countries and so corporations they go to these countries to exploit labor and these are the corporations that we look at and we say there is a way if you read Proverbs there is a way to make a profit. There is a way to live a life as an entrepreneur. There is a way to do business and have wisdom in a godly way. There is a way. But the people that we idolize are people being led to destruction in the day of judgment. So we need to check our hearts and say, God, truly, what is success? Will I live a life? Will I be, will I idolize? Will I Yearn to be like someone who is systematically oppressing others. Or I look to you and say, God, exalt others above myself. We must be a church that rejects arrogance in every form. We have to reject it in private when others want to elevate themselves through slander. We have to reject it publicly by not presuming to make plans about our lives without submitting our wills to the will of God. We have to reject it systematically by anticipating God's judgment on the ones who oppress the poor and not idolizing their lifestyles. We have to Come to a place to say, God, I do not want to live a life in opposition to you. I don't want to live a life where I am opposed by you. Whether in my private conversations, in my public planning, or my systematic idolatry. God, that we would be a people that rejects the arrogance of the world. And that in everything that we do, that we exalt you. That we exalt others. That we live humble lives before God in an open-handed way saying, God, where you have me, I will go. Your success is measured in kindness and peace and self-control and goodness and not having my own way and love. Lord, your way in the church is is a system of honor, of in private elevating others above myself, of not speaking poorly about others, but speaking highly of my brother and my sister around others. To live humble before each other, to live humble before God, and to resist arrogance in any place we can find it in our hearts. And say, God, I want to live a life that exalts your name above every name. Will we be a church that rejects the arrogance of the world? Will we be a church that rejects pride in all its forms and all of its ways? Will we be a church that looks at the different ways that arrogance seeps in and say, God, we do not want to be a people that are opposed by you. 
Let us be a people, Lord, that are humble before you. Can you stand with me and pray?